Well, greetings everyone, and thanks for coming to this warm up uh, session talk regarding the Arcadia and Capella and NASA System Engineering Handbook introduction, as well as um, modeling overview with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce myself, but, but it's done, so, so let's go directly to the next slide. Um, so now let's talk about the talk life cycle instead of the agenda. Um, first of all, um, we will address the introduction of the NASA System Engineering Handbook, um, following by an, an introduction of a model-based system engineering. Then I present the Arcadia and Capella approach, and finally, um, the modeling overview with the Hubble Space Telescope. So before starting the presentation, uh, I would like to introduce um, a famous sentence from George Box, which is, all models are wrong, uh, but some are useful. And why this sentence? Because I'm not an ASA system engineer, engineer sorry. And, and also I wasn't involved in the development of the Hubble, but I will introduce modeling of space system, which is the Hubble. I mean, um, the MBSC artifacts that I will present are all maybe wrong from technical or scientist point of view. But that could be useful to illustrate and to understand what is the Arcadia approach and the use of its modeler, uh, which is Capella. So let's start by the first step of this talk, aiming to introduce what is the NASA System Engineering Handbook. And we will not review the entire handbook, but just giving an overview of one of the three processes described um, in this document. So what about the NASA System Engineering Handbook? Um, this handbook is intending to provide a general guidance and information on systems engineering that will be useful um, to the NASA community. Um, it provides a generic descriptions of system engineering as it should be applied throughout NASA. And moreover, it describes system engineering best practices that should be incorporated in the development and implementation of large and small NASA programs and projects. And, and the handbook introduces the fundamental of system engineering, uh, the NASA program or project lifecycle, the system design process, and we will talk about that later on this uh, presentation, uh, the product realization process, and finally, the cross-cutting technical management process. And the manual is useful as educational tool for developing uh, system engineers and is for those taking engineering courses. Also, what you can see is expanded uh, guidance for NASA system engineering books, volume one and two, uh, provide information from the NASA system engineering, including um, listen learned, model-based system engineering, functional ed uh, analysis, um, and so on. So um, what about the system engineering from NASA? Um, NASA defines system engineering as a methodical, multidisciplinary approach for the design, uh, realization, technical management, operation, and retirement of a system. But what is a system? A system is a combination of elements that function together to produce the capability required to meet a need. The elements include all hardware, software, equipment, facilities, personal processes, and procedures needed for this purpose. And the results include system level qualities, properties, characteristics, functions, behavior, and performance, and the value added uh, by the system as a whole, beyond that contributed independently by the parts, um, is created by the relationship among the parts, that is, how they are interconnected. It is a way of looking at the big picture when making technical decisions. It is a way of achieving stakeholder, functional, physical, and operational requirements in the intended use environment over the planned life of the system within cost, schedule, and other constraints. 
And when we're talking about system engineering, we have to talk about system engineer and the exact role and responsibility of the system engineer may change from project to project, depending on the size and complexity of the project and from phase to phase of the life cycle. Um, for large projects, there may be one or more system engineers. And for small projects, the project manager may sometimes perform these practices. Um, but whoever assumes those responsibilities, the system engineering function shall, shall, shall be performed, right? And the system engineer usually play the key role in leading the development of the concept of operations and resulting system architecture, defining boundaries, defining and allocating requirements, evaluating design trade-offs, balancing technical risk between systems, um, defining and assessing interfaces and providing oversight of verification and validation activities, as well as many other tasks. Um, as you can see, the NASA uh, specify three sets of common technical processes, which are system design processes, product realization, and technical management. Um, the processes of the system engineering engine are used to develop and realize the end products. And the first one is the system design process, which is used to define and baseline stakeholder expectations, generate and baseline technical requirements, decompose the requirements into um, logical and behavioral models, and convert the technical requirements into a design solution that will satisfy um, the baseline stakeholder expectations. And the second process is the product realization process, which is applied to the system structure, um, starting from the lowest level product and working up to the higher level integrated products. And these processes are used to create the design solution. And finally, the last one is the technical management process, which is used to establish and evolve technical plans for the project, um, to manage communication across interfaces, to assess progress against uh, the plans and requirements for the system products or services, um, and to control technical execution of the project through to completion and to aid in the decision-making process. Um, to be compared to a V-cycle, uh, the system design process uh, corresponds to the top-down flow of the V-cycle and the product realization corresponds to um, the bottom-up flow of the V-cycle. And addition to that, the cross-cutting technical management process is, let's say, the transversal flow passing through this, this um, um, V-cycle. So the next slide will be focused only on the system design processes. As described in the NASA System Engineering Handbook, um, the system design processes are interdependent, highly iterative and recursive processes um, resulting in a validated set of requirements and a design solution that satisfies a set of stakeholder expectations. Um, there are four system design processes, which are developing stakeholder expectation, technical requirements, logical decomposition, uh, and design solution definition. And these processes start with a study team collecting and clarifying the stakeholder expectations, including the mission objectives, constraints, design drivers, operational objectives, and criteria for defining mission success. Mm, this set of stakeholder expectations and high-level requirements is used to drive an iterative design loop where the concept of operations uh, and derived requirements are developed. Um, a simplified uh, validation asks the question, will the system work as expected? Um, is the system achievable within budget and schedule constraints? And if the answer to any of these questions is no, then changes to the design or stakeholder expectation will be required. And the process starts again. Um, this process continues until the system architecture, concept of operation and requirements meet 
the stakeholder expectations. So let, let's go deeply in, in this process. First of all, the stakeholder expectations. Um, it is the initial process um, within the system engineering engine that establishes the foundation from which the system is designed and the product is realized. And the main purpose of this process is to identify who the stakeholders are and how they intend to use the product by eliciting and defining use cases, scenarios, concept of operation and stakeholder expectations. As activities um, through these processes, and as you can see here, uh, there is the stakeholder identifications, uh, which mean who will have an interest in the product or project. And after the stakeholders identification, the goal is to understand what is expected from them. Um, thoroughly understanding the customer and other key stakeholder expectation for the project or the product um, is one of the most important steps in the system engineering process. Um, I would say it provides the foundation upon which all other system engineering work depends and it helps ensure that all parties are on the same page um, and that the product being provided will satisfy uh, the customer. And when the customer, other stakeholders and the system engineer mutually agree on the functions, um, characteristics, behaviors, appearance and performance the product will exhibit, it sets more realistic expectation on the customer's part and helps uh, prevent significant requirements creep later in the life cycle. So um, through interviews, discussions, surveys, marketing groups, emails, or some other means, um, stakeholders specify what is desired. And the goal is really to identify the needs from stakeholders that will drive the system design. And one important thing is if one stakeholder is missing in the identification or needs are not clearly established, it can lead to an unusual or let's say unmarketable product. Now, what about um, the technical requirement definition process? Uh, this process transforms the stakeholder expectations into a definition of the problem and then into a complete set of validated technical requirements expressed as shoal statements. Um, and the requirements should enable descriptions of all inputs, outputs, and required relationship between inputs and outputs, including um, constraints and system interactions with the operators, uh, maintainers, and other systems. Um, and as activities, uh, the goal would be to define constraints that the designs need to adhere to or that limits uh, how the system will be used. Also to identify external and enabling system with which the system should interact and establishing physical and functional interfaces uh, like mechanical, electrical, thermal, and so on. And to define functional and behavioral expectation for the range of anticipated uses of the system as identified um, in the concept of operation. Let's say the main activity behind the technical requirement process is to uh, define requirements itself. And the NASA system engineering handbook specify different types of requirements, just naming a few of those. We have the functional requirements, defining what functions need to be performed to accomplish um, the objectives. Uh, performance requirements, defining how well the system needs to perform the functions. Um, and interfaces requirements defining connection between the system and its external system according to the system boundary. High level requirements are decomposed into functional and performance requirements and allocated uh, across the system. Um, another important thing is the traceability of requirements to the dollar was lower. Uh, will ensure that each requirement is necessary to meet the stakeholder expectations. 
um, requirements that are not allocated to the lower levels or are, um, are not implemented at a lower level can result in a design that does not meet objectives. Um, and how it help you, there is the validated technical requirements, which is the approval set of requirements representing um, a complete description of the problem to solve. Then um, the logical decomposition, um, this process identifies the what that should be achieved by the system at each level. Logical decomposition uses functional analysis to create a system architecture and to decompose top level or let's say parent requirements and allocate them down to the lowest desired levels. Um, the logical decomposition process is used to improve understanding of the defined technical requirements and the relationships among the requirements. Um, and decompose the parent requirements into a set of logical decomposition models and their associated sets of derived technical requirements for um, input uh, to the design solution definition process. Um, the key first step in the logical decomposition process is establishing the system architecture model. Um, system architecture activities drive the partitioning of the system elements and requirements to lower level functions and requirements. Um, interfaces and relationships between partitioned subsystem and elements are defined as well. Um, once the top level or parent functional requirements and constraints have been established, the system designer uses functional analysis to begin to formulate a conceptual system architecture. Three key steps in performing functional analysis are translate top level requirements into functions, um, decompose and allocate functions to the lower level, and then identify and describe functional and subsystem interfaces. Each function identified uh, is described in terms of inputs, outputs, um, failure modes, consequence of failure, and interface requirements. Um, the system architecture can be seen as the strategic organization of the functional elements of the system laid out to enable the roles, relationships, dependencies, and interfaces between elements to be clearly defined and understood. It is, uh, let's say, strategic on how its elements fit together to contribute to the wall instead of on the particular workings of the elements themselves. It enables also the elements to be developed separately from each other while ensuring that they work together effectively, effectively to achieve the top level or parent requirements. Then finally, um, the design solution definition process is used um, to translate the high level requirements derived from the stakeholder expectation and the output of the lo logical uh, decomposition process into a design solution. This involves transforming the defined logical decomposition models and their associated sets of derived um, technical requirements into solutions. And once the preferred design alternative has been selected and the proper level of refinement um, has been completed, then the design is fully defined into a final design solution that will satisfy the technical requirements and the concept, uh, concept of operations. Um, the design solution definition will be used um, to generate the end product specification that will be used to produce the product and to conduct the product verifications. Um, this process may be further refined depending on whether there are additional subsystem of the end product that need to be defined. Okay, now um, a word about the functional analysis from the NASA system engineering handbook. Um, in order to design, develop and prove any space engineering system, 
the mission and consequent functions that the system should perform should be clearly established. This functionality should be distributed throughout the different design levels. Um, this allocation of the system function in a systematic way is an important step in establishing a design which meets all the design objectives. And functional analysis is uh, the technique of identifying and describing all the functions of a system. Um, the purpose of the analysis is to identify and partition out the functions of any system required to perform the intended mission. At the top system level, the required function should be derived from uh, the mission statement and are the basis of the system functional specifications. Um, the different objectives of the functional analysis are to identify functional requirements, um, ensure the functions are partitioned, allow traceability between functions, and identify interfaces between functions. And as you can see through this slide, um, the functional block diagrams can be used to perform functional analysis. Um, these diagrams are made of functional blocks. Each represents an action to be accomplished. And the functional architecture is developed using a series of level diagrams showing the functional decompositions uh, and their uh, logical relationship. Just, so just to comment um, the figure on the, um, on the left, we have the function 4.0, which is perform mission operations. Uh, we have functional dependency with the function 3.0 and 6.0 uh, at the top level, right? And at the second level, we have a refinement of the function 4.0 uh, refined into function from 4.1 uh, uh, to 4.11. And then at the last level, let's say the third level, we have a functional refinement of the function 4.8, which is acquire polite data, uh, from a refinement from function 4.8.1 to 4.8.9. So here we have clearly a functional dependencies uh, between functions uh, and, and also a refinement from the top level to the, to the third level um, of the functions. In addition to that, two more diagrams can be used for the functional analysis. Um, first of all, the state diagram uh, can be helpful for understanding and displaying the complex timing relationships in a system. It simplifies the understanding of a system by breaking complex reaction into smaller and smaller known responses. Um, then the context diagram also you can see here, uh, in order to identify the boundary of our system. This diagram plays an important role in establishing the requirements for the system. And the goal is to identify all external systems that will interact with our system, or let's say our system of interest. Okay, so uh, what do we review during the, the first step? Um, the NASA System Engineering Handbook goal, then introduction of the system design process. So now it's time to talk about uh, a model-based system engineering approach, which can be applied to the system design process. So let's start by the introduction of the model-based system engineering uh, approach. Um, well, Traditionally, um, large projects have employed a document-based system engineering approach. It is characterized by the generation of textual specification and design document in hard copy or electronic format like PowerPoint, Word, or Excel that are exchanged between external stakeholders, users, for example, or internal stakeholders, subsystem engineering or test engineering, for example. Uh, requirements and design information are expressed uh, in these documents and drawings. Um, and drawing tools are used to capture system design, such as functional flow diagram or schematic block diagram. 
And these are stored as the separate files and included in the design documents. Engineering trade studies and analyses are performed and documented by many different disciplines to evaluate and optimize alternative designs and allocate performance requirements. So um, the document-based approach can be rigorous, but has um, some fundamental limitations. The completeness, consistency, and relationships between requirements, um, design, engineering analysis, and test informations are difficult to assess since um, this information is, pressed, is uh, spread sorry, across uh, several documents. And this makes it difficult to understand a particular aspect of the system and to perform the necessary traceability and change impact assessments. Um, this leads to a poor synchronization between system level requirements and design and lower level hardware and software design. Um, it also makes it difficult to maintain and reuse system requirements and design information. Um, and this limitation results in inefficiencies and quality issues that often show up during the integration and testing or worse um, after the system deployment. For all these reasons, um, a model-based system engineering approach has appeared, and MBSC can be defined as a formalized application of modeling to support system requirements, um, design analysis, verification, and validation. Uh, also, it is uh, intended to facilitate, facilitate sorry, um, system engineering activities and results in enhanced uh, communication um, among the development team, specification and design quality and reuse of system specification and design artifacts. Um, the output of the system's engineering activities is um, a coherent model of the system where the emphasis is placed on evolving and refining the model using model-based methods and tools. And the MBSC has the greatest benefit to a program or project or activity when it is employed early in the life cycle. Um, I would say new starts should consider MBSC approaches to improve risk posture and design efficiency. Um, late in the design life cycle, many of the system integration decisions have been made, which greatly limits the utility of the MBSC applications. Um, so, employing model-based system engineering approach early allows the system engineer to make the system integration decisions um, with a much clearer view of the system integration issues. So, what about the modeling? Um, the model-based system engineering is based on modeling activities. Um, a system model is created using a modeling tool and contained uh, in a model repository. Um, the model consists of elements that represent uh, requirements, design elements, and their relationships. Um, but there is no universal language that can cover all conceivable systems. So a reasonable solution is to define domain-specific modeling languages. And currently, I would say the system's modeling language for CSML is an often used modeling language for system design. Um, CSML is a general purpose graphical modeling language that supports modeling activities. Just to name a few of diagrams, we can find activity diagram representing behavior in terms of the ordering action based on the availability of um, input, output, and control. Uh, we have a sequence diagram representing behavior in terms of sequence of messages, uh, messages exchange between um, function, uh, port, or operator. Uh, and we can have also a use case diagram representing functionality in terms of how a system is used by its external entities. 
And modeling activity have different uh, objective. Here you can see a sample of the, of the objective. For example, characterize uh, an existing system, specify and design a new or modified system, uh, evaluate a system, or uh, train users on how to operate or maintain a system. But what about a model-based system engineering across uh, the system engineering engine from the NASA? Um, traditionally, the system design is captured using a variety of methods and is rendered in different forms from narratives and drawings to some partial models addressing particular aspects of the system, such as state charts or spreadsheets. And a challenge with these descriptions is, to, is that they are difficult to integrate and their consistency uh, is hard to prove. Associations and relationships among the disparate data sources are provided uh, in a model-centric approach that enables communication, navigation, um, comparisons, version configuration management, and um, aggregation of relevant information across the repositories. And with a model-based approach, or model-based system engineering approach and modern standards and tools, the system engineer represents the design in system descriptions and with it that defines the next lower level of the design. Um, in representing the design, the system engineer can create models that provide a more coherent descriptions of the system's design. Um, multiple views of the underlying models may be created to enable the design to be communica communicated and understood by the stakeholders and to enable them to verify that the system will address um, their concerns. A view may be arranged to present a selection of model elements chosen to demonstrate that a particular set of concerns are indeed um, addressed by the design. So here you can see uh, the different MBSC contribution according to the different process in the system design processes from the NASA system engineering handbook. For example, for the process stakeholder expectation, um, the need goals and objectives are kept within the models and from the top tier of eventual requirements flow down. Regarding the technical requirements, the contribution will be uh, that the requirements are kept within the models. For the logical decomposition, uh, requirements can be categorized into functional, behavioral, performance, and so on. And this can be used to develop functional block and behavioral diagrams. And finally, uh, the design solution definitions, um, hollow integration and information and designs uh, from different engineering domains supporting the single source of truth. But what about the benefits of um, the model-based system engineering? Um, the model-based system engineering does not affect process, but will enable the opportunity for overall better quality, lower cost, and lower risk for several reasons. And these benefits come about because um, from an overall benefits, uh, from overall samples, uh, we have enhanced communications, reduce development risk, encourage collaboration, uh, manage complexity, automatic document generation, uh, reuse of existing models in several projects, uh, better requirements traceability, more stakeholder involvement, digitalizations, and a single source of truth, which is very important. And from the NASA, the different benefits um, could be um, the model-based artifacts, for example, can be generated automatically, uh, lowering the effort to keep them up to date with the result that artifacts can be always match the best, the, the best um, available information. Um, and, and then uh, navigation, traceability, and integration of information are facilitated 
facilitated in the model-based uh, approach. Okay, so uh, during the second step of this talk, we addressed a high, um, I would say a high uh, level overview of the MBSC introduction with it, its benefits. Um, now it's time to be focused on the Arcadia approach and uh, its modeler, uh, which is Capella. So what about um, Arcadia and Capella? So um, model have been used as part of the documented based approach for many years, including functional flow diagrams, behavioral diagrams, or schematic block diagrams. However, the use of models has generally been limited in term um, in scope to support specific type of analysis or selected aspects of system design. Um, the individual models have not been integrated into a coherent model of the overall system. And the modeling activities have not been integrated into the system engineering process. So Arcadia with its modeler Capella is one of the answer to the lack of an overall modeling activities, including method, tool, and language. Um, it provides an opportunity to address many of the limitations of the documented based system engineering by providing a more rigorous means for capturing and integrating system requirements, design analysis, and so forth. So Arcadia analysis and design integrated approach for Arcadia is a structured uh, architecture engineering method for defining and validating multi-domain systems based on archi architecture-centric and model-driven engineering activities. And Arcadia is a method a method based on functional analysis and focuses on developing the system by starting from the needs analysis and solution development up to the integrated verification and validation. So through uh, this approach, we can find four different perspectives or four different viewpoints. And the first one is the operational analysis uh, perspective. So the operational analysis focuses on analyzing the customer needs and goals, expected missions and activities, and far beyond system requirements. And the key question behind this perspective is what the user has to accomplish. Then the second uh, perspective of Yupon is the system analysis. Um, and the system analysis focuses on the system itself in order to define how we can satisfy the former operational need along with its expected behavior and qualities. And the following elements are created during this step. Functions or services to be supported and re related exchanges, um, non-functional constraints like safety, security, and so on. Uh, performance allocated to the system boundary and interaction between the system or the system of interest and the operators and so on. And the key question beyond this perspective is uh, what the system has to accomplish for the users. And then the third viewpoint is the logical archi architecture. And this viewpoint is starting from previous functional and non-functional need analysis and a first definition of the solution expected behavior is performed using functions, interfaces, data flows, behavior, and so on. And the key question behind this perspective is how the system will work um, to fulfill expectations. And then we have a last uh, perspective, which is the physical architecture one. And the physical architecture has the same intent uh, as the logical architectural building, except that it defines the final architecture of the system at this level of engineering. Um, once this is done, 
the model is considered ready to be developed. Uh, it notably introduces resource component that will embed former behavioral components. And the key question behind this perspective is how the system uh, will be developed and built. Um, so designing complex and critical systems and more generally architectures that are subject to multiple functional and non-functional constraints is an activity which requires um, a level of rigor that can only be provided by formalized and tooled modeling approaches like the one based on Arcadia uh, Capella. So Arcadia Capella is based on method language and diagram. Um, what about the, 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 the method? Um, the Arcadia method enforces an approach structure on different engineering perspectives, as the one uh, explained uh, before, establishing a clear separation between system context and need modeling uh, or operational analysis and system analysis and solution modeling for logical and physical architectures. Then what about the language of uh, Capella? Um, the Arcadia concepts are mostly similar to UML or CCML standard and the NATO architecture framework. Um, because of the focus on architectural design, some of the CCML concepts have been simplified or specialized in order to better match the concepts system engineering practitioners already used in their um, engineering documents and assets. And then we have diagrams. And Arcadia method is supported by various kinds of diagrams, largely inspired by UML and CSML. We have architecture diagrams, data flow diagrams, functional chain diagrams, uh, sequence diagrams, tree diagrams, and so on. Uh, so let's go uh, deeper in the different descriptions of the different diagrams. Uh, so first of all, we have breakdown diagram, uh, which is stakeholders, function, components, uh, decomposition through a graphical tree, right? Uh, which can be referred to a breakdown structure. We'll see that later on this presentation. We have also capability diagram, uh, equivalent to a use case diagram used to organize the functional analysis. Um, then the di data flow diagram provide information exchange between functions. And this is what you can see uh, on the bottom right of this slide with acquire image function and elaborate current um, situation and the different functional dependencies with the functional flow between those two functions. Uh, we have also architecture diagram uh, described the assembly of components or function and interfaces. We have also a scenario um, providing dynamic behavior between functions. Uh, modern states providing the working type of function or actor or system. And finally, a class diagram, uh, data class diagram complex of exchange items or data parameters Utilize, utilize, uh, utilized, sorry, in the system. And during the, the, the next slide on the Hubble Space Telescope, we will address all this diagram. So what about um, the functional analysis of, of this approach? Functional analysis constitutes the major support of the understanding and the expression of need in Arcadia, as well as for the definition of the expected behavior of each system component during the design stage. Um, as an overview, four steps have to be performed. First of all, the system definitions. Um, this activity consists of defining the system and its boundary. And the goal is to understand the capabilities and constraints of the system for all activities required to be performed and all external interfaces. Regarding the, the functional tree, oh, this, is, this is what you can see on the right of the slide, it shall provide a clear visibility of the large number of functional elements make up a system. A hierarchical structure starting at system level, 
working down in detail show a low verification that um, the lower level functions are consistent with the top level functions. And as you can see, um, for example, uh, three levels of functions uh, are identified. Level one, uh, which is the, the green box for the system analysis, the level uh, two for the logical architecture, which is the blue box. And finally, the level three for the physical architecture, uh, which is the, um, the yellow box. And then the functional architecture should be a system representation which represents interfaces between functional entities. Um, it should make up use of limited symbols like boxes, lines, arrows, and textual information, as you can see here on the bottom right. Um, there is function representing in yellow, corresponding to the lower level of the analysis, with functional flow between function forming dependency graph, and also functional port giving order and direction to the diagram. Um, the green functional port uh, is related to the output, right? And, um, and the red one is related to inputs. So this, this um, functional architecture is a very, I would say, a static representation of, uh, of the function of the system. And on the left of this slide, you can see also a sequence diagram showing uh, the dynamic functional exchanges between functions. And we will go deeper in this analysis later on this presentation. So the functional analysis is essential in architectural definition because it defines um, and justifies architectural components and their interface definitions. And the different steps have to be performed accordingly to the approach adapted, which are, for example, uh, top-down, uh, bottom-up, or use case driven. So now um, let's address the different perspective in detail. Um, first of all, the operational analysis. And as a reminder, uh, the first viewpoint aim at answering the question, what the user need to accomplish? And to do so, we have to define uh, stakeholders needs and uh, environments by capturing and consolidating operational needs, um, defining what the user has to accomplish, and identifying actors and activities and concepts. And at this level, the system is not yet recognized as a modeling element. The operational analysis is performing prior to the definition of the expectation of the system itself. Um, the operational analysis introduces four main activities. The first one aims to define the operational actors and capabilities by developing operational entity diagram and operational capability diagram. Um, and the operational entity diagram is focused on the identification of entities and actors leading to the stakeholders identification, for example. And an entity can be defined as a group or an organization that will interact with the system. Actor is defined as particular case of non-decomposable operational entity. Um, let's take the following example. Um, universities can be defined as entities because it is related to an organization or group of person or group of actor. Then students or professor, et cetera, can be defined as actors because it is not a decomposable entity. Um, then we have the operational capability diagrams aiming to provide high level uh, service being reached. And the second activity uh, aimed to define operational activity and describe interaction based on different diagrams, which are, for example, operational activity diagram, defining the activity that have to be performed by stakeholders and operational activity scenario, describing the dynamic behavior of activities. Then the third activities aim to allocate operational activities to operational actors. And at this stage, activities and interactions are allocated to stakeholders in order to describe the operational archi archi architecture, sorry. Uh, moreover, operational process can be defined, which is a series of activities 
that contribute toward an operational capability. Then the last activity uh, is based on um, transverse modeling with a modern state diagram that can be related to a life cycle diagram, for example. Then the second viewpoint is the system analysis. And this layer aims to formalize system requirements by identifying the boundary of a system, defining what the system has to accomplish for the users and modeling functional data flows and dynamic behavior. To do so, five activities are proposed. First of all, the actors, missions and capability um, definition based on two main diagrams. Um, the context, contextual system actors diagram aiming to identify environments and actors that will interact directly with a system of interest. Then the capability diagram, which can be related to system use case diagram, for example. Um, the system capability provides a high level service allowing it to carry out an operational objective. Um, the second activity aims to define the functions of the system and describe, describing sorry, the functional exchanges. Um, and functional exchanges are unidirectional exchange of information between two functions. Um, these activities are based on three main diagrams, functional breakdown diagram, uh, functional data flow blank diagram, and functional scenario. And then the third uh, activities uh, aims to allocate function to system and actors based on two main diagrams, the system architecture diagram and the exchange scenario. The system architecture diagram allow us to identify which actor will support which functions. And this is the same case for the system. Um, moreover, you'll be able to identify physical exchanges uh, and logical exchanges, allowing circulation of functional exchanges. We will see that later on this presentation also. Um, an important feature is the functional chain, uh, which is element of the model that enables a specific path to be designed among all possible paths. Um, and the last two activities are based on the definition of interfaces and the transverse modeling addressing, let's say, functional mode of the system, as well as data types identification explained through a data class diagram. Then the logical architecture. Um, this third viewpoint addresses the logical architecture, aiming to see the system as a white box and defining how the system will work so as to fulfill expectations. The goal will be to refine the functional breakdown diagram from the system analysis, um, to identify elements or let's say subsystem of the system or logical components, then allocate sub function from the functional refinement to the sub to the system uh, elements. Sorry. So as defined in the system analysis viewpoint, the first activity is to identify the functional breakdown structure of this viewpoint, uh, defines functional flow data flow, sorry, and create functional scenario. Then the goal is to define logical components through a logical component breakdown structure diagram. Um, a logical component is a structural element within the system, and it can have one or more logical functions. It is also possible to identify a logical breakdown structure. And the next activity uh, is to allocate logical function to logical component by introducing the logical architecture diagram. Um, then delegate system interfaces and create logical interfaces following by um, an enrichment of the logical scenario and processing uh, modeling. And the last one, uh, the physical architecture aiming to develop the system physical architecture corresponding to the concrete component to implement it to the system. According to the physical functions, we have to be refined from the logical function. Um, physical components have to be defined as well. Then an allocation of the function to the component have to be performed through um, the logical component. Then, as well as the logical architecture viewpoints, physical interfaces and enrichments of the scenario are proposed. Um, 
So that's all for the physical architecture. Now I would like to highlight some different add-ons uh, available uh, in Arcadia uh, Capella. So Capella proposed several add-ons to implement in order to unleash the power of the mother-based system engineering uh, workbench. Um, just for example, we have the mass viewpoints enables to simplify, describe the non-functional aspect of mass in Capella. We have the performance viewpoints enables to simplify to simply describe, sorry, the non-functional aspect of performance in Capella. I would like to highlight us also uh, XHTML DocGen uh, enables the end user to generate an HTML website from Capella project. Uh, sharing models with uh, all stakeholders is essential in model-based system engineering. Uh, publishing and sharing HTML versions of models helps make models uh, and the reference of all engineering activities. Um, and also we have M2Doc, uh, aiming to generate Microsoft Word documents from Capella models. Um, also, what is not shown here, uh, because it's, let's say, um, uh, free access uh, add-ons, we can find also a few commercial add-ons, uh, like uh, Rectify for Capella from Daso Systems. It enables users to trace objects from a Capella project to Rectify tool, which provide um, requirement traceability capabilities. Or uh, just to give another example of what is available as commercial, there is a model-based safety analysis bridge for a safety architect providing a new viewpoint to perform a complete safety analysis using standard methods like FMEA or FTA and generate the corresponding fault trees. So everything is uh, everything uh, are available in the Arcadia website. So if you want learning more about Arcadia and Capella, let me recommend to have a look on the website. Um, you'll find a lot of information like tool features, add-ons, Arcadia approach, and so forth. Moreover, you'll find a lot of documents available from the Capella community, like resources, academic material, webinar, and so on. In addition to that, I will highly suggest two books one from Jean-Luc Voirin called Model Based System and Architecture Engineering with the Capella, uh, sorry, with the Arcadia Method, right? And one from uh, Pascal Rock called uh, System Architecture Modeling with the Arcadia Method. And finally, uh, the YouTube channel proposed Capella course by Mr. Tony Comor, for example, as well as webinar or Capella Day video and so on. And if you need assistance or help by using Capella, you'll find throughout the modeler a help section providing information on Capella guide, like user manual, gloss glossary or diagrams. And addition to that, you can access to the Capella forum in order to post questions and the community will try to answer you uh, by the best way. Well, as introduced at the beginning of this talk, the NASA System Engineering Handbook uh, details uh, system design process, including four activities. And these four activities can be supported by a model-based system engineering approach. And to do so, an appropriate method and tool is necessary as the one provided by the Arcadia approach with its model or capilla. Um, and this is an MBSC solution supporting system modeling activity. So just giving, just to give a, a high level overview, for example, uh, the stakeholder exp uh, explanation can be, could be supported by the operational analysis. The requirement definition can be supported by um, the system analysis perspective from Capella. Uh, the logical decomposition from the NASA system engineering book and book can be supported by uh, the logical architecture perspective from Capella. And finally, uh, the design solution definitions uh, can fit with the physical architecture perspective uh, from Capella. 
So just to summarize, um, the requirement definition process and technical solution definition process from the NASA system engineering handbook can be supported by the Arcadia approach with the need understanding and the solution architectural design. Well, um, so um, the next step uh, is the core of the talk based on the modeling overview uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, taking into account uh, the system design process from the NASA system engineering handbook applied to a model-based system approach uh, as the one provided by Arcadia Capella. Um, so let's go. Um, so first of all, I would like to introduce uh, what, what is the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but before, as you can see, uh, the goal is not to apply uh, the MPSC approach uh, with Arcadia to the entire system, but just to apply a few diagrams in order to deeply understand the Arcadia approach. So uh, first of all, I would like to introduce um, the, the, the space telescope. Um, since the dawn of civilization, uh, humans have been limited in their understanding of the universe by their vision and their imagination. And the telescope is the indispensable instrument uh, for investigating the cosmos. And the Hubble Space Telescope is a large space-based observatory which has revolutionized astronomy since its launch and deployment by the Space Shuttle Discovery in uh, 1990. So scientists have used Hubble to observe some of the most distant stars and galaxies yet seen, as well as the planets in our solar system. Um, orbiting high above the Earth, the Hubble Space Telescope has a clear view of the universe, free from the blurring and absorbing effects of the atmosphere. I would say um, this is one of the advantage of the space telescope. Uh, currently, ground-based telescope like extra-large telescope for ELT or 30-meter telescope for TMT um, does not need a particular technology to fix atmospheric turbulence. Um, this is what we call adaptive optics, a high complex system, including a deformable mirror. And space telescope, as it's distant from Earth, does not need any adaptive optic technology fixing Earth's turbulences. Um, so the Hubble is a cast grain reflector telescope, and light from celestial objects travels down the tube, uh, is collected by a curved primary mirror and reflected toward the smaller one, which is the curved secondary mirror. And then the light is focused on a small area called the focal plane, where it is picked up by its various science instruments. What about a few facts uh, of this system? Um, the Hubble Space Telescope was the first astronomical observatory to be placed in orbit around Earth within the ability to record images in wavelengths of light spanning from um, ultraviolet to near infrared. And launched on April 24, 1990, above the Space Shuttle Discovery. Hubble is located about uh, 340 miles above Earth's surface, where it completes 15 uh, orbits per day, approximately one every 95 uh, minutes. And the satellite moves at the speed of about five miles per second and fast enough to travel across the United States in about 10 minutes. Um, what about um, also a few explanation uh, about the science, the science, sorry, of the telescope. Um, on first glance, our solar system seems to be well understood. It includes a single star, planets, and their moons, and so forth. And yet scientists uh, continue to discover fascinating new findings about our solar system. And Hubble has contributed to these discoveries by providing a detailed look at the planets moons, rings, uh, comments on other objects. Hubble is helping to answer age-old questions about how the solar system began, how planets formed, and how the Earth evolved. 
Um, and from its unique vantage point in space, the Hubble Space Telescope provides us uh, with a clearer sense of the history of the universe and our place in it. Um, by allowing scientists to study the origin of the universe, the earliest galaxies and the mysterious repulsive force known as dark energy, Hubble is helping to answer age old questions such as where did we come from or how will the universe end? And Hubble continues to explore scientific frontiers and many are still um, shrouded in mystery, waiting for science to explain them. Also, uh, Hubble will likely contribute to the discovery of other cosmic wonders like black holes or gravitational waves. So now, uh, what about the MBSC? As a reminder, the main goal of the operational analysis is to focus on analyzing the customer needs and goals, expected missions and activities far beyond system requirements. Through Capella, you just have to select the operational analysis activity through the Explorer. Then you will be able to access to the diagram editor providing the palette to create your operational um, diagram. So first of all, what about the operational entity breakdown diagram? Um, again, which is focused on the mapping of the stakeholders and environment. So according to uh, three main entities have been identified. The first one is the space uh, with five different, uh, let's say actors, same as identified in the slide explaining the science objectives of the telescope. We have exoplanets, uh, cosmic wonders, galaxy and universe, stars, nebulas, and solar systems. Then there is the Space Science Telescope Institute uh, based in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, they help humanity to explore the universe with different advanced space telescopes. And four main entities are identified. And one of them is the missions with the head of the Hubble Space Telescope. And that, as you can see also, uh, there is the head of the Nancy Grace Raman Space Telescope, which is another space telescope. And finally, on the left of this slide, uh, we have the Goddard Space Flight Center. It is the home of the Space Telescope Operation Project, uh, the government's team of technical managers and scientists who oversee all aspects of the space telescope missions. Um, we have a refinement. Um, the Space Telescope uh, Operation Control Center uh, is located at the Goddard Space Flight Center, and it consists of Mission Operation Room and Operation Support Room. And the Mission Operation Room is the primary command and control room, and the Operation Support Room is the room to manage testing or running contingency procedures. And so we have entities, and we have defined different actors, uh, in the mission operation, uh, uh, we can find um, engineers, manager, operator, scientists, and this is the same case for the operation support entity. And to communicate with telescope, uh, the, the STOCC uses NASA Space Network, and this network consists of constellation of satellites in geosynchronous orbit named uh, the Tracking and Data Related Satellites, which is the TDRS, um, as well as ground facilities that support and communicate with those satellites. Um, Hubble commands are transmitted from the STOCC and routed through dedicated radio dishes at the White Sands complex uh, to the TDRS spacecraft and then to the telescope. So we have the TR TDRS and the white sand test facilities, which can be uh, compared to a big antenna in order to, to communicate with the telescope. So here, this is uh, the mapping of, let's say, stakeholder um, and environment. Um, now, what about the operational capabilities diagram? Um, it aims to identify a high level service being reached. And as you can see, um, there are entities identified in the previous diagram. There are the Space Telescope Science Institute 
and the Godard Space Flight Center. So regarding the space flight, uh, the, sorry, the Space Telescope Institute, uh, that we help turn great science ideas into great science, which can be one operational capability. Then they will highlight the results as well as the peer-reviewed science program selection, uh, planning and scheduling of the telescope characterizing the performance of the instruments, maintaining and enhancing the, the archive of data, and making the data freely uh, available to the world. And the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, will monitor space telescope as it travels around the Earth, point the, point the telescope at a cosmic target and solve any problems that arise. Um, and as you can see, manage daily operation uh, operational capability uh, is, uh, is uh, affected to the Space Telescope Science Institute and to the Goddard Space Flight Center because both will interact during the maintenance operation. And this is the same case for the managed daily uh, mission operation. So here again, we have an overview of what are the different operational capabilities of, um, of the different entities identified previously. So now let's focus on the operational activity interaction diagram and the operational architecture diagram. First of all, in the operational activity integration diagram, which is OAIB, uh, the yellow boxes represent activities and all arrows represent, let's say, activity dependencies uh, as inputs or outputs. Just to give an example, we have uh, an activity which is create common timelines, uh, which depends on another activity, which is planning and scheduling. And these dependencies is related to the, to, to the exchange between those two activity, which is request. And at this, uh, let's say stage, uh, we identify the different activities that must be performed, but we do not identify who we perform this activity. And then on the right of the slide, there is the operational architecture diagram or OAB with entities of the operational entity diagram. And what you can see here is the communication medium dependencies between, uh, between entities. For example, um, um, the tracking and data relay satellites will use wireless communications uh, to translate, uh, to transmit uh, information to the wide sense test facilities. And this is exactly the same case between the Space uh, Telescope Operation Control Center and the wide uh, sense test facilities. So we define activities. We define, let's say, the arrangement of the operational architecture. Uh, now it's time to allocate the different activities to the different um, entities. So this is the, um, the goal of what you can see on the left of this slide. Uh, it shows the allocation of the previous activities identified in the operational activity diagram to entities. So we can, let's say, or I hope, easily understand who will lead which activities. You can see also um, operational, operational processes, which are monitor space environment and select a cosmic target. So for example, um, a Space Telescope Science Institute will host the following uh, activities uh, that will highlight the results, that will archive the data, uh, they will plan and schedule, uh, create common timelines, and so on. Um, but okay, uh, what about the operational uh, processes? For example, um, which is the red line for monitor space environment, we can easily understand who, um, which entities will be impacted by these operational processes. For example, so for the monitor space environment, for sure the space will be impacted with the activity, which is diffuse light. We have the tracking and data array satellites and wide sense test facility. 
because they will uh, broadcast information from space and broadcast information from Earth. And then mission operation will manage the science and engineering data recorder. And then they will transmit the science information to the Space Telescope Science Institute. And the Space uh, Telescope Science Institute will highlight the results and then they will archive uh, the data sets. So this is really a, a static, uh, let's say, representation of the operational architecture. And on the, um, on the right of the slide, this is the dynam dynamic behavior representation of the different uh, exchange exchanges between um, between entities corresponding to the static um, architecture, let's say. Okay, uh, so now I think it's um, clear on the objective uh, of the entity uh, uh, and the need associated. And uh, now it's time to start about um, thinking about a system solution. So the goal of the system analysis viewpoints, which aims to understand what the system has to accomplish for, a user, for the user. So through Capella, you just have to select the system analysis activity through the Explorer, then you'll be able to access to the diagram editor providing the palette to create the system diagram. So what about the solution? On the right, you can see the conceptual system actor diagram aiming, aiming to map all system or external system that will interact with our solution. We already know that our solution is the Hubble Space Telescope and so space will interact with it as well as the tracking data relay satellite. Moreover, we saw previously that the telescope should be designed to be maintained. And what you can see here is also interaction between the space shuttle and astronauts. So this diagram is not only focused on interaction in the normal operation life cycle phase, but also in the servicing operational life cycle phase. On the left, there is the mission capabilities blank diagram aiming to identify the high level capability uh, that our system must perform. So the mission of our system will be to provide space imagery solution and the different capability will be uh, provide, image, uh, provide image or space environment without atmospheric constraints, um, distribute and acquire data and track a cosmic target. And we can refine the capability provide an image of, of space environment by provide the ability to detect very faint objects, provide the ability to produce ultraviolet images, provide the ability to produce infrared images, and so on. Um, now let's focus on the identification on main internal function of our system of interest through the functional breakdown diagram or SFBG. The first function called F1 is the capture cosmic light. This function will acquire light from space in order to provide optical images to be translated into data by another function, which is F3 uh, for translate light into data. Um, while operating in Earth's orbit, the Hubble Space Telescope depends on a robust pointing control system to determine the direction in which it is pointing, uh, to turn toward the celestial target and to remain fixed on the target during observation. So that is the goal of the function F2 called uh, control pointing. Then the telescope has to receive and set command from and to Hertz, which is the goal of the function F4 by managing communication with Hertz. And finally, the system has to be powered up in order to be operational. In fact, the Hubble requires electricity to power its science instruments, computers, and other electronic equipment. And to fulfill that need, the Hubble's electrical power system produces, stores, controls, and distributes electrical energy for the entire spacecraft. And the system must be autonomous in terms of power supply. So the light from space is the input of the transit light in energy in order to be power, uh, to power the entire system. So the function F6 is uh, absorb and store energy to power the system. Now, what you, what you can see here is the modern state diagram providing, let's say, the life cycle of our telescope. So there are four, uh, sorry, five main phases in this life cycle. The pre launch operation, the deployment, the mission operation, servicing operation, and finally, the post-deployment operation. 
Um, what uh, is also mentioned is the trigger event switching from a mode to another one. For example, ready to be deployed, switch the branch operation to the deployment one. And the ready for mission operation, switch the deployment mode to uh, the mission operation and so on. And what is uh, also shown here is a very high level life cycle process of the telescope. Maybe a more detailed analysis should be welcomed in the real development activities. So let's focus on the mission operation phase. And according to few activities are performed like activation of external main bus power, transmission with the TDRS, deployment of solar array, uh, ground operation control center begins with communication via a relay satellite, and the space telescope start collecting space images. So all functions identified previously will be part, as you can see here, of the mission operation phase. So now what about the functional data flow bank diagram? Um, it is focused on the functional exchanges between functions, establishing functional dependencies. And we can find uh, all main functions identified in the previous diagram, which are capture cosmic light, translate light to data, and so forth. And green box represents system functions, and blue box represents uh, actors' functions. On each function, there are small green boxes and small orange boxes representing inputs and outputs. If for example, the function F6 uh, will acquire light from the function diffuse light. So this function uh, F6 will absorb and store energy to provide, uh, let's say, functional flow, which is power to the function F5, F1, F2, N4, and F3, uh, in order to power up the entire system. So here we have function and functional flow between function. Um, what you can see uh, from this analysis is that from the diagram, the capture cosmic light function could address the Hubble Space Telescope as well as the James Webb Telescope. In fact, we are not focusing on the physical solution or let's say free from physical solution, but in main functions that need to be implemented uh, in order to answer to the needs identified in the operational analysis. And according to the capture cosmic light function could be a segmented mirror, uh, the one proposed by the James Webb Telescope, which is based on 18 elementary mirror that can be controlled by the wavefront sensory and control process, or a monolithic mirror, other one proposed by the telescope. Here, the system architecture diagram identi identifying logical and physical connection between the system and actors. The Hubble Space Telescope has a sophisticated uh, communication system that enables the telescope to receive comments from Earth-bound controller and to transmit large amount of scientific and engineering data back to, to the ground. According to TDRS, we communicate with the telescope through the space network, um, the logical link, and through a wireless communications means the physical uh, link. What is also possible is to identify by which physical connection the logical one will pass through. Here, um, the space telescope will pass through the wireless uh, communication means. Here, um, this is the same diagram that presented previously, uh, but uh, with functional analysis. In fact, this diagram aims to clearly identify our system of interest with its functional allocation and actor that will interact with it. Um, the diffuse function is allocated to the space uh, and broadcast information from the space um, from from space function. Sorry, is allocated to the uh, to the tracking and data relay satellite. And functional flow identified um, from um, the space telescope is. Um, information to Hearst and functional flow from the TDRS is information from Hearst. Um, the logical connection is the space network, uh, which passing through the wireless communication as physical link, and has a specified in the, in, in the diagram, two functional flows are, are going through the space network. Moreover, we could detail functional flows from the telescope as real-time recorded engineering data and as real-time and recorded science data. 
There is also a functional chain called provide uh, image of space environment in blue line. And this functional chain uh, aims to rapidly identify which function will be, will be impacted by this chain. For example, um, the provide image of space environment um, functional chain will impact the capture cosmic light function, the translate light into data function, the manage data uh, science and engineering, and finally, uh, the managed communication with Hertz. An important part of the system engineering involves ensuring coherence between the data managed in the system and the data exchanged uh, with external actors. In order to ambiguously describe these exchanges, the data or information must be formalized, and Capella provides advanced mechanisms to model bit precise data structures and relate them to functional exchanges or components. Here, an example regarding information from and to Hertz or between system and the TDRS. Information from Hertz could be a science data selection, meaning what range of wavelength scientists uh, would like to recall. In this context, the data can be ultraviolet, visible, and so on. Also, scientists uh, could um, program a record according to uh, the day or the hour record selection. For example, the science data data one record selection corresponds to uh, the ultraviolet spectrum one and is referring to the wavelengths between uh, uh, 175 and 300 nanometers. And this is the same case for the information from Hertz. Um, according to the science data selection and to the time record selection, the recorded data will be provided according to the data types uh, explained here. Um, now, um, let's focus on the sequence diagram. And this diagram aims to analyze this from a dynamic behavior, the functional exchanges between main internal functions uh, and the system of the system, sorry, and external functions. So there is first of all the function scenario showing only functions and dynamic functional exchanges. And on the left, there is the exchanges scenarios, which is the same as the functional scenario, but showing the system and external system. So through the exchanges scenario, it is also possible to identify the mode in which the scenario appears, which is linked to a system capability, as you can see here. So here is specified the functional exchanges in the context of the tracking cosmic uh, target capability. So the sequence diagram shows the functional exchanges from the system architecture diagram at the left of the slide and as introduced previously. And when we identify new functional exchanges in a sequence diagram, the system architecture diagram will be automatically updated. Um, what we can do also through a sequence diagram is to identify the directions between two different functional exchanges. Here, for example, uh, regarding the functional scenario, we have um, an exchange between uh, F4 and F2, which are managed uh, communication with Hertz and control pointing. And the, direct the direction between those two different functional exchanges should be less than x millisecond that need to be specified. So it is possible to specify the direction through through these dynamic uh, functional exchanges. OK, so now I hope it's quite clear on the objective of our system in terms of functional expectations, main function dependencies, external interfaces, and so on. Now it's time to go deeper in the architecture by addressing the logical architecture perspective. So as before, through Capella, you just have to select the logical architecture activities. Then you'll be able to access to the diagram editor providing the palette to create your logical diagram. So what you can see here is a functional refinement from the system analysis that can be done with the functional breakdown diagram, showing the tree diagram of the logical architecture perspective. Um, the first layer of this uh, diagram um, is from the system analysis uh, and below the function refinement called here subfunctions. 
So for example, um, regarding the function F6 absorb and store energy to power the system, uh, we have different uh, sub functions, which are collect sunlight energy, uh, manage energy, distribute energy, command sunlight collection or store energy. Uh, let's take uh, another example for, uh, for the capture cosmic like function which has been identified in the system analysis perspective. In the logical perspective, we have the following sub function, let's say. We have collect light, focus light, control sunlight protection, protect from uh, sunlight, control optical focusing, and align instruments with focal plane. So here we have, a, let's say, a high level functional tree diagram uh, of uh, the logical architecture perspective. So after identifying a tree diagram of functions, um, the functional data flow diagrams for LTFB aim, aims us to understand the functional dependencies uh, between sub-functions. Um, for example, we have uh, the F1 with uh, the different sub-functions, which are collect light, focus light, and so on. And in the transit light to data, we have the following sub-functions, which are provide wide field imagery in ultraviolet, provide ultraviolet spectrum, measure the relative position of brightness of stars, obtain high resolution of spectra, and provide wide, uh, wide field imagery of invisible uh, wavelengths. So what we have to do is uh, to make functional dependencies between those different sub-functions. Um, and what, also what you can see here is another functional chain, which is optical input flow, right? And this functional chain specify which function will be impacted by the optical input flow. So for example, uh, and for sure, uh, all capture cosmic light will be impacted by the optical input flow, but also all different sub function of the function transit light to that data will be impacted by this uh, optical functional flow. Um, so now, what about the logical component breakdown diagrams aiming to establish logical components of the system? So let's take example of few of them. For example, uh, for example, in in the system we need actuators, right? And the different actuators that we do need, we have the spin actuators or push pull actuators. In order to logically design our system, we do need sensors. We do need sensor orientation sensor, uh, sun orientation sensor, sorry, uh, Hertz orientation sensor, direction sensor, attitude sensor, or locking sensor. Uh, we do need also optical telescope assembly with light collector, uh, light concentrator, and focal plane. And also, regarding the different instruments, we will need a wide field imaging sensor, a spectrograph imaging sensor. Um, ultraviolet sensor and so on. And through this diagram, it is also possible to identify the uh, constraints. This is what you can see uh, on the bottom left of the slide. We have constraints, which are wavelengths that we do need to identify, and each uh, logical component will be impacted by those constraints. Um, this diagram, which is the logical architecture diagram, um, is considering uh, without any, let's say, functions, okay? What you can see here is the arrangement of the logical components with some logical interactions. And this arrangement is based on the logical breakdown structure identified previously in the LCBD. So the Hubble Space Telescope's mirror-based optical system collects and focuses light from the universe to be analyzed by, the, by science and guidance instruments. The optical system called um, the Optical Telescope Assembly, or OTA, uh, gives Hubble a unique view of the universe by gathering infrared, visible, and ultraviolet light. Okay, and as you can see here is also optical, which is a logical interaction between 
the optical telescope assembly and the instrument subsystem, right? Um, also, uh, as before, uh, constraints can be identified uh, addressing the different instruments. For example, ultraviolet sensor, uh, the constraint allocated to this logical component is the wavelength uh, between 175 and 300 uh, nanometers. Really? So we wait, yes. Sorry for the inter uh, interruption. Uh, just to let you know, you have five minutes before you, we have to cut and uh, answer questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Um, thank you. Uh, so, okay. We are doing the logical architecture. Uh, this is the same as introduced previously, but with allocation of the different function uh, from the functional analysis uh, at this perspective. So, what you have to do here is just to allocate function to each logical component. For example, light collector component uh, host, uh, will host the function collect light, or uh, spectrograph imaging sensor will host the function obtain high resolution spectra of resolution. Um, here you can see um, uh, also um, sequence diagram, it changes. Um, between different logical components, exactly as explained uh, just before in the functional analysis. Um, but we can also identify um, the functional mode according to the different logical components. For example, um, the parting processor in the fine parting mode will provide a command to the spin actuators, uh, logical component, or uh, the push pull actuators. I will try to, to speed up. Um, uh, the traceability can be also established in different ways after having complete logical components and logical function identification and allocation. Capella offers the possibility to perform the traceability through a traceability mat matrix. Here, the row corresponds to the logical components and the column uh, to the logical functions. And for example, the function F1.4 is allocated to the operator dual uh, logical component. So what about the physical archi architecture? Um, I will try to explain uh, the, this one that will be more relevant. Um, um, here, an introduction of the physical breakdown structure showing the physical decomposition of the telescope. And let's focus on few components with the logical and functional location. First of all, the sensor, which is related to the pointing cultural subsystem. The five types of sensor make up the pointing cultural system. The core sensor, uh, the magnetic sensing system, the gyroscopes, the fixed head star trackers, and the fire guidance sensor. And each type of sensor serves a unique purpose, ranging from row attitude determination to protecting the telescope. And all of the sensors work in tandem to adjust the Hubble's attitude and command. So you can see here the functional allocation to the logical component, and then the logical component to the physical uh, component. For example, the function spin telescope uh, is allocated to the logical component spin actuators, and the logical component spin actuators uh, is allocated to the physical or the real component, which is the reaction wheel uh, assembly. Um, so now, in order to illustrate the functional decomposition up to the physical architecture, I propose to refine the control pointing function from the system analysis. So the function F2 control pointing is from the system analysis. We define through the logical architecture uh, the refinement from function f2.2 to the function f2.8. And through the, um, the physical architecture, it is also possible to refine those functions. For example, the function 2.3 has been refined in function from 2.3.1 to 2.3.3. So here we have a full definition of uh, one of the component of uh, our system, which is the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so here, this is an example of a physical architecture, which is not complete, just to give an overview. We have different components, which are the NASA spacecraft computer and the control unit science format units. So we define logical components uh, that, that, that have been um, allocated to this component. We define the different function uh, that the different logical component has to be performed. And we define also uh, physical connection between components. Here we have cable, right? And through the cable uh, has to be passed uh, the computer command data protocol from the logical architecture. 
So here we can have through uh, the physical architecture, we can define the full, the complete uh, architecture of our system. Um, and also just, just, just to finish this slide, I think it's quite important. It's another example of the communication system and the satellite sends and receives signal through different types of antenna, right? Um, we have uh, the we have the uh, S band signal access transmitters, um, transmitting real time science, recorded science, and recorded engineering information through a single channel. And the multiple access transporter have two channels, I and Q, which can be transmitted simultaneously. And the I channel can be sent down a real time science, while the Q channel can can transmit a real time engineering. So what you can see here is the interaction between physical and logical component. Um, also, there is a class diagram introducing the speed of each channel as well as the data transmitted uh, by each of those. For example, the real-time engineering will pass through the channel Q at a speed uh, between 4 and 32 kilobytes per second. And the last one, Capella offer a different way to share uh, models and data. And according to what we've done through the four perspectives, uh, all information can be shared through HTML5, M2 doc format, or through uh, the team for Capella corresponding, let's say, to a cloud for Capella. Uh, so that can lead to a single full of truth, resulting in an enhanced communication among the development team, specification and design quality, and reuse of system specification. Um, Thank you very much. It's why it was very speed. I, <laughs> I'm really sorry for that. Uh, I really hope you enjoy this time with me. Um, Thank you, Remy. Don't worry, <laughs> you're not uh, free yet. I'm guessing that your throat must hurt a bit after two hours explaining all that. That was yeah. a very dense presentation, so thank you very much. <laughs> Now we have a number of questions. I'm sorry for speeding you up, but you know, time is time. So I know. first questions, the most voted one is, uh, what are some examples of when you would recommend using SysML versus Capella and Arcadia? Are there any uh, guidelines or rules of thumbs that you are aware of to choose between these two? Oh, that, that's a good question. Uh, I would say one, if I understand well, one, one of the advantage of Capella is uh, the process which is Arcadia. And if we're choosing a CCML tool, uh, CCML is not a method, it's a tool. So I, I really I really recommend Arcadia and Capella because it integrates method, tool, and language. And from my understanding, I don't think, or maybe I don't know, there is another uh, process integrated uh, a tool at the one provided by Arcadia Capella. I don't know if it's answered the question, but I really recommend to to deploy Arcadia in, in all projects. Okay, uh, I'm biased, so I, I won't add <laughs> anything, but thank you. Uh, the second most voted question is, uh, what are the techniques, analyses, and tools that may exist that could be used to validate stakeholder and technical requirements beyond reviews? Uh, and especially, mm. I believe, in the context of a linking with Capella. Mm. What a good question. I don't think um, Arcadia or Capella propose such, a, let's say, techniques. But I would say um, the main, um, the, the, the main, let's say, process will be to, as soon as we have uh, the first diagram from, from Capella, uh, as soon we have to provide this diagram to the stakeholder, but before we have, we have to introduce to the stakeholder how to read this diagram. Um, for example, um, operational process diagram or operational architecture diagram, sorry, or um, entities diagram. We do need to share those diagram as soon as possible, uh, right? To make sure that all stakeholders are involved in the development of our project and to make sure we will design the right uh, the right system. But we, we, there is not, I think, a clear uh, definition of this process. That, that would be my recommendation, so. Okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, another question has received a number of votes. So what does the relationship between logical and physical components mean? 
More specifically, can logical components be realized as behavior or node host physical components? Mm. <laughs> what, a good, what, a, what a good question, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Um, I, 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 I can understand that it's quite difficult to, 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 to make the difference between a logical component and physical component. Um, let's say logical component is uh, let's say an arrangement of functional uh, of function that can be allocated to a logical component. Uh, and the example uh, I, I try to explain through my presentation is we have, I, I, I've defined a logical component, which is a sensor, but I don't know what, what will be the sensor. I know that I need sensor, right? But at this, uh, at this level, I don't know what, what, what could be the sensor. Right, and at the physical architecture level, I know exactly what will be the sensor. For example, the the cosmic uh, observer spectrograph and so on. I know exactly what will be um, the um, the component. Uh, let me take another example, which is not in this presentation. Um, the data, the data can be transmitted from two different logical components. Okay, and the exchange, the interaction between the two uh, logical components is data. But at this perspective, I don't know what will be the physical medium that the data will pass through. And in the physical architecture, I define um, the physical interaction between those two physical uh, components. And that can be uh, fiber, optical fiber. Optical fiber can pass uh, data. That could be uh, Ethernet. That could be I2C. I don't know. So this is really the difference uh, from, from, from my side, really the difference between a logical and an architecture. Just to summarize the logical, I know that I do need sensor. I know that I do need actuators. I know that I do need processor. And physical architecture, I know that I need FPGA. I know that I need a reaction with assembly. I know that I need... Um, uh, another uh, sensor from the Hubble. Uh, so this is really the, the difference between those two perspectives. Just to make it very, uh, very speed, I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, another question uh, is, someone is wondering why you are correlating the high level functions uh, F1 to F5 to the main structural elements of the system, in particular in the SA perspective. Uh, it seems about uh, it seems a bit surprising from a pedagogical standpoint, since these functions may be the most appropriate ones. But uh, the the person who asks the question would not illustrate them with the system constituents. I, I believe that the question is really. It looks like you have a one-to-one -one mapping between functions and components in your example, which is not uh, a very pedagogical way to present the. Uh, the Capella Arcadia methodology, uh, where a function is allocated to a component, but there can be many functions allocated to a single component, and that's the right. point of this allocation step. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. Um, I, I'm not sure if you fully understand the question, but um, um, in fact, at the system analysis, so I, I've defined main function that, uh, that, that, uh, that I found in the different website. So F1, F2, F3, and so forth. And that's all for the system analysis. Then at the logical architecture perspective, um, I'm, I, I try to refine those functional analysis because at the system analysis level, uh, I have a function which is capture light, but I'm not really able to allocate this function to a logical component. So I refine this functional this function into three or uh, two or three different sub functions, which are uh, reflect light, uh, focus light, and so on. So uh, these uh, sub functions uh, have been allocated to logical component, and at the at the let's say the last step at the physical one, uh, I've refined uh, some different function. But it's not, it's not, I would say, it's not mandatory to refine uh, all functions. I would say the main goal is the function you define 
uh, if it can be allocated to a component, that's fine. But in my example, uh, another example, uh, I have a function which is trans translate light into data. I don't really know how, uh, what kind of component uh, could host this uh, very high level function. So that I do need to refine that in order to have sub function or a sub sub functions and then allocate that to, uh, to, to a component that can be developed. Because at my, from my understanding, uh, um, uh, I do not know what could be the components uh, that can be host um, the function translated to data. Mm -hmm.